We're looking at slides on computer screens. So each one is a step away from the magic of his original touch, his masterful touch. But go to Chris Winfield Gallery and take a look at some of his beautiful originals. Go to the San Jose Museum, which has a beautiful uh, collection. Um, the De Young Museum has a beautiful collection. These are all places where David has exhibited. And the Crocker Museum uh, has several of his images on permanent display and closest to home. I was just in the Monterey Museum the other day and, and thoroughly enjoyed standing in front of one of David's uh, still lifes right there as you enter the door. So Laguerre is everywhere uh, and beyond. His work is in the permanent collections of New York's Museum of Modern Art, um, the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Italy. And we'll see that Europe and uh, Italian and Greek philosophy influences his current work. Without further ado, I want to turn it over to the last of the true aesthetically considered and well-educated gentlemen of the art world, David Laguerre. Thank you, David. Thank you, Brian. Actually, I would rather say the first rather than the last. <laughs> right. Uh, what Brian will show you is that um, it would give you a sense of the, of the scale of the paintings as we go along and look at them. This is about five feet square. And it's one of a series of paintings of thrown draperies that I did back in the 1970s. And I started doing these, they were all named after Greek islands. This one is named after the island of Simi. Attempt to make a painting of drapery that was like the Hellenistic sculptures where the heads and the arms had been knocked off of a marble sculpture and all that was left was a draped torso. And it, it reminded me of that. So I began thinking about Greece at the time, as I said, named, these are all named after Greek islands. But the, um, I did an exhibition of them in uh, 1978 in New York. And uh, it was a, a good successful exhibition and all, but I thought, you know, there's only so many times that I could do these. I had been making them for a couple of years. Some of them are very large. Some of them are, are, are like uh, 110 inches wide by, uh, by 70 inches high, something like that. And, uh, but I had done a number of them and uh, I wasn't actually running out of the names of Greek islands yet, but I uh, <laughs> thought that it would be maybe more interesting to continue with the idea of ancient Greece and begin working directly with the narratives, the stories from ancient Greek, the myths, the philosophy, and so on. And, uh, and I didn't know anything about those things. I just simply began studying and learning about why the Greeks made the sculptures, paintings, and so on that they did. Um, this installation shot, which was from the Crocker Art Museum when they did a retrospective of my work about six years ago. It gives you an idea of how big these paintings are. Wow. This painting, which I made in 1980 called Penelope, is the first successful painting. I tried a number of things before that, trying to make paintings that represented what I thought the myths and stories of the ancient Greeks should be. Penelope was the wife of Odysseus, and Odysseus is the hero of the Odyssey. And she was a very, very patient and strong-willed woman. And I thought that was a really interesting person to make a painting of, just being, just sitting, being patient, waiting for Odysseus to come home from the Trojan War is what she was doing. And he, he was coming home, but he was going through all kinds of adventures on the way. But she was, a, she was an amazing woman. And this is, this is actually based on, uh, on a, a, a Greek grave stele, a, a, a tombstone uh, of the, um, uh, the grave stele of Hegeso. Excellent. So many of the paintings that I have made have ancient predecessors and uh, or even not necessarily ancient, but as far back as the Renaissance and so on. Uh, this is a painting from the Iliad and uh, it's the central point in the book of the Iliad. Now the Iliad is one of the very first 
texts from uh, Western culture and is extremely important for its depiction of human figures, of, of humans acting, not always acting nice, uh, but in this case, Achilles, which is the figure over on the left-hand side, is uh, at the coast, at the beach, near the beach, receiving the body of Patroclus, who has been killed in battle. Patroclus was his great friend, and uh, Achilles had gone into a funk because he had uh, had the woman taken away from him uh, by uh, Agamemnon, and uh, and I mean. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, 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 it makes me a little bit tongue-tied to try to tell the story because it, it's all so involved and there's so much to tell, but it's the, it's the pivotal point in the book of the Iliad when, uh, when Patroclus is brought back to the beach and Achilles goes into his rage and changes the whole tenor of the war. And uh, the quote from the book is um, that the low light, this kind of low light here, the quote from the book is that Hera, uh, the ox-eyed queen of heaven, now told the tireless sun to sink into the stream of the sea. It's because she has been holding up the sun while the battle is going on to, to uh, recover the body of Patroclus. And, uh, and finally, he's brought to the brought to the, uh, back to the beach and where Achilles was, and she allows the sun to then set. So that's, you know, only a, a, a misrepresentation uh, of the story, but it is a wonderful and, and really, really important story in Western literature. And, and as you described in, in some of your beautifully written essays, your, your aim is to, well, it's not your complete aim, and I'm sure I'll misrepresent your aim, but uh, the lessons, the truths that are found in, in uh, Greek uh, and classical artworks are still relevant today. And you hope that we will benefit, that our own lives will benefit from, from this knowledge. These are foundational ideas that the ancient Greeks were working with. And out of, out of nowhere, they were coming up with ideas and thoughts that are so deep and so resonant and have resonated for so many years. And by the way, the, your, your sharp-eyed viewers there may recognize this composition because it was, a, I, I uh, pretty much stole the composition from a Titian painting, a wonderful Titian painting of the deposition of the body of Christ. And uh, it's a, a painting that's in the Louvre, but I have to say that, that Titian based his painting that's in the Louvre on a painting by Raphael of the same subject, similar kind of a composition. And Raphael based his painting on a, a sarcophagus that has the similar sorts of figures carrying a body of, of Meleager actually, but a very, very similar composition. So I really liked that idea of each artist sort of understanding uh, uh, and, and, and learning from an earlier artist and uh, making, a, uh, making very similar compositions. Yeah, you, you become part of a lineage of history. You're carrying the torch. Yeah, and, it, and it's a kind of legal cheating, actually. <laughs> and there's the painting over on the right, and, uh, and the painting in the center is Hercules uh, protecting the balance between pleasure and virtue. Uh, Again, another story from ancient times about Hercules, who has, who is being, uh, who's 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 being asked to choose between two different uh, possibilities: pleasure and the easy life, or uh, or the difficult life, which would give him uh, everlasting fame. Beautiful. And this is a figure of a, of a man shooting the arrow into the air. And I have to tell you that I, I, I really am very, have been very adamant about making paintings that were about specific themes, about specific ideas, specific stories, like Achilles and the body of Patroclus. Um, but I was teaching at the University of Notre Dame in, in uh, South Bend. And uh, I had just been talking to the students about uh, about that process, about 
when you choose a theme for yourself and you set up a target for yourself, this idea, and then you make a painting about that idea and, and pretty much you can see whether you have been successful or you have not been successful. And so um, I had just been talking about them doing it, uh, saying that it was like setting up a target and shooting an arrow at that target. And uh, it was, um, uh, and you could see whether you would hit it or you didn't hit it, you know, and that was the process of making a narrative painting. But I was just after that in the art museum at, at uh, Notre Dame, and there was a, a, a book that had a picture of an engraving of this exact subject like this, of a man shooting an arrow into the sky and directly above him. And it was from the 16th century. And um, he, he, I, I, I so loved the arrow going off the top of the canvas that I had to make a painting of this. So this painting, to give you an idea, this painting is 10 feet tall. So the figure is basically life size in it. And this painting is in the, at the Crocker Art Museum. It's in the stairwell, which was kind of the only place that they could put it because it's so tall. Uh, and so it is on permanent view there. What a treat. Uh, and that's the Salinas River, by the way, that is in the, in the distance there. Beautiful. We're, we're going to see some of your magnificent uh, landscapes uh, in this in the presentation. Um, but I wonder if we sh we should ask you to tell us a little bit about your training. Uh, I mean, it's an understatement to say you have mastered oil painting, uh, and you went to the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, which is a real taskmaster of a school. Uh, tell us about your. It is a real taskmaster of schools, Brian, and you probably know. I mean, because they also are a, a school of photography, and uh, which you probably know about. And the um, and they they're 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 real. Uh, their 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 most famous aspect is they are an automotive design school. So all of the really great cars that you see out on the road, or so many of them, uh, were done by art center students, or, you know, graduates. And uh, yeah, no, I, I went to Art Center. I started going to Art Center when I was um, in high school and I was going there doing figure drawings. And, uh, um, but it was a, a, was a wonderful place to study. Uh, they had very, very difficult classes. I mean, all of the students would complain about how much work we had to do because it was six days a week. And, uh, and yet, um, I, I mean, everybody, um, uh, were uh, uh, is is uh, thankful that we had that kind of an education. I had a whole group from Art Center come to my studio a couple of years ago now, and uh, they were up here. They were up here for the um, uh, the Concours d'Elegance, and uh, they um, came to the studio, and and we had just the best time. I think there were like sixteen of them, and we just had the best time going on about this teacher or that teacher or this class or that class. And, and, and it was really, really fun. So anyway, yes, Art Center was great, a great place to study. Uh, do, do you feel that these same rigorous skills uh, are still being taught in art schools today? No. Or do, do you no, they're not, they're, they're, I, I think they feel that they're not really necessary. And, uh, and, and we had very, very wonderful specific uh, assignments where all of the students were doing the same thing. I find oftentimes now in the schools, students are given leeway to do what they wanted to do and then bring it all together and give a crit. And, uh, and, and, and that has a value, but um, I do think that uh, it's, there's a greater value in all of the students doing exactly the same thing and then seeing who was the most su successful at it. Mm -hmm. and that also gives us a chance to realize that each of us see the world through our own our own eyes, you know, we, we could be uh, rendering the exact same object and yet in a sense our personalities or psyches show up. Uh, well, that, that, that's hoped as, as, the, as the part of the end game actually. Yeah, well thank you so much David for fielding uh, questions about your life. The diver. Yes, and this looks like a younger uh, David Laguerre too. Yeah, well, this was from about 2000, so okay. 20 some odd years ago now. Yeah. And uh, this was um, in, at the uh, Copland Gallery in Los Angeles. 
uh, that painting, this painting is now in a private collection in Dallas. But, uh, but I mean, the, the, the reason for this making a painting of a diver as I have, actually in the book, there's a picture of me diving into the Aegean Sea. Uh, which is part of the inspiration for it, but the real inspiration for it is the diver's tomb in Pestum in Italy. It was a Greek colony in Italy. And uh, the, um, uh, the, the diver is meant to represent a figure that is kind of between life and death, between one element and another. And, uh, and in this one, I have him, he's, he's basically hovering in the, in the sky. He's not going down into the water, but I have made other paintings of divers who were actually just touching the water. I like mm -hmm. that idea too. But uh, yeah, and the funny thing about this painting, it was shown in an exhibition in Gdansk, Poland. And uh, it, was a, it was a group exhibition, but they used this diver painting as their advertisement for the, for the show. And uh, it was on billboards all over Gdansk, if you can believe it. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure that that would be allowed on billboards in the US. Right. Oh, it, this deserves to be on a billboard, but though, that's fantastic. Fantastic scale. This is Shepherd in the Ruins of Delphi and with a subtitle, Et in Arcadia Ego. One of the first themes that I began working on when I decided to make uh, paintings of, of Greco-Roman narratives uh, was this idea of, of et, in Ar et, et, et in Arcadia Ego. Et in Arcadia Ego is, is a Latin term, and uh, what it means is, here am I meaning, here am I death in this ideal landscape. And, uh, and I, 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 Nicholas Poussin, who was a, a, a big influence on my work, or the, the uh, 17th century French artist who lived in Rome all of his life, um, he made a painting of shepherds around a tomb and looking at this inscription, the same inscription, et in Arcadia Ego. And uh, they, I, 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 I thought and thought about this theme and how to do this theme. And I ended up doing it, uh, thinking about it, not as the death of an individual, but as the death of uh, really an entire civilization. And Delphi, if probably some of your uh, viewers here have been to Delphi in Greece, and uh, Delphi was once considered to be the center of the world. I mean, it was an extremely important site where the Delphic Oracle was. And uh, Delph the, uh, the people would come from all over Greece and maybe other areas as well, to consult with the Oracle when they had important decisions to make. Some of those decisions were like, should I go to war or not? And, and uh, uh, but they would come and they would uh, consult the Oracle and the Oracle would give them, usually give them a very, very obscure answer that they had to then go to another concession where they did the interpreting of the Oracle's uh, response. So it was a it was a business that was going on there, but uh, it was um, it was very, very important. But, they, but that was a very, very important uh, city in the world uh, at that time. And now, of course, it's completely gone, except for hotels and that sort of thing that are there because of the ruins. There's so many different wonderful perspectives to come in at your work via and uh, a friend of mine uh, this morning sent me a video, just a kind of a funny video, although a tragic video about uh, a, a person going around Times Square and asking young people questions like, can you name a continent? <laughs> and yeah. it's unbelievably tragic. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I never sound so old as when I say the kids these days, you know, yeah. that's what our parents used yeah. to say. But that's my way of saying that you do require something of your viewers. Uh, and you, in your writings, you you are so eloquent. You said we are in need of a renewed desire for knowledge, uh, and a what we need is a passion for learning. Uh, I think that's your hope that maybe your work will help foster this. But your work does require uh, knowledge on our part. And what are your th you're well aware of that? How do you feel about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, what I'm hoping for is that that indeed most people most adults don't really know what these subjects are. Uh, 
But what I'm hoping always with these works is that they're a doorway into, uh, into another world. Um, and basically what they beg is a question. What is this? What's going on here? Why is this happening? Who is this? Um, all kinds of questions like that. And, and, and that's the, the uh, sort of tragic thing that I find is that so often um, people, not just younger people, but, but uh, older people as well, don't ask questions. They don't look for the, the, the rational answer behind what it is that they're seeing or hearing. And that that's the important part to ask questions and to learn about, uh, lear well, learn about history because certainly it gives us a perspective about our own period. Beautiful. I think that's one wonderful way of describing all of the of your fans who are here today. You know, the Ali participants are curious people. You know, and, and I think that's, that's a wonderful, a wonderful thing. Yeah. yeah, and and by. Uh, me doing my homework for preparing for your beautiful presentation today your artwork caused me inspired me to enter your works and learn some of the things that i i had no idea about greek culture so you are in your way helping to promote education well and and that kind of these kind of greek stories have been um sort of out of the art world for uh, quite a long time now and uh and I, I, I just thought at the time when I began doing this, which was about 1979, which was it, 1979, after I had done the exhibition in New York. And, uh, you know, there were so many artists who were making what we call contemporary art. There were so many artists who were doing all manner of things, abstract expressionist paintings, uh, minimalist paintings, minimalist sculptures, videos. I mean, I mean all of the things that are the menu of possibilities for making art today. And there were so many of artists doing those things, some of them very good, but I just thought, you know, there are enough artists doing all of those things. I would like to do something else entirely. And uh, I, I decided to begin making these paintings the way that I have, um, really sort of as, as a chance of doing something a little more dangerous than because, because Contemporary art is what is embraced by all of the galleries, by museums. Everybody wants the auction houses, enormous prices for contemporary art in the auction houses. And, uh, and it's taught in all of the schools, universities. And um, I think that, uh, that um, that's all well and good, but, but basically it's academic now. Yeah, beautiful. David, you are inspiring me to quote you uh, today. And if, if some of our particip participants didn't read every single word of your essays on your website, I, I want to highly um, recommend that. Here's, here's just a little paragraph that I wrote just in my own words, trying to summarize what I learned about you. David's seemingly conservative depiction of subjects in togas is actually radical in its opposition to today's trendy and to use one of David's many fantastic phrases in its, in its opposition to today's trendy fashion conscious mania for novelty. He, David knows what he's doing is dangerous and he knows it's out of vogue with today's, another great quote, obsession with nowness. Uh, so, you know, uh, something else I learned, uh, what is so wonderful of the multi layers of meaning in your work, David, Far from this being conservative, David knows this is the most radical style of painting being done today. Everyone else is trying to, to, to use another one of your uh, beautiful terms, the predictability of, um, oh, what was it? Uh, I want to say clunkiness or like Jean-Michel Basquiat. You know, uh, everybody is dying, including myself, to be a terrible painter, a folk art painter, you know. Uh, I, and you said everyone's trying to be so edgy, it actually turns out to be very crowded over on the edge. <laughs> it is, yeah. Beautiful. And, you know, as I say, some of them are doing it very well uh, for for what they're doing, but it's uh, but it it is it is very very crowded on the on, edge. On the edge. And I also love. And it's not the edge anymore. It's the center, actually. Absolutely, absolutely, predictably, uh, predictably avant-garde uh, appearing. It yeah. also, 
you know, some of you also enjoyed uh, a few of David's passages in his essays when you said that uh, co contemporary gallerists <laughs> are waiting outside graduate schools like drug dealers. <laughs> it's That's true. Great. It's true, and and they and they really are. They're going to the students' show and and pulling students from those shows and showing them in major galleries in in New York, for instance. UCLA is famous for that, isn't it? In yeah, so is Columbia, so is Yale. Yeah, uh, these these are uh, <laughs> they, they they want they want the latest thing, and uh, so yeah. yeah. Uh, sometime we can talk about why an artist makes art. And when you talk about young, impressionable graduate students, uh, you know, hoping to succeed uh, in, at UCLA, young people go to that grad school in hopes of being snatched up to uh, a Los Angeles gallery. Uh, personally, as an art teacher for many years, you know, that's a terrible reason to be an artist. That's a terrible reason to go to UCLA, hoping, you know, looking completely beyond your own voice and just looking at the uh, golden egg at the end, you know, uh, going for the prize. Certainly that's not why you make your art, David. Uh, well, um, no, but it, but um, have, being in exhibitions and I've been in, in many, many, many exhibitions over the years, um, it is one of those things that uh, um, has, that, that having paintings sell enables me to continue to make the paintings that I really want to make. Now, this particular painting, which is called Landscape with a Specific View, and uh, if you have read the, the um, essays that I have written or the interviews, um, you'll know that, that I do have quite specific views about things. And, but I, I learned in the process of, of reading and learning about uh, ancient art that um, oftentimes, whole systems are described in tripartite terms, in other words, in, number, in numbers of three. And uh, of the, 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 I mean, most obvious one is uh, Aristotle's uh, uh, description of, of a play actually, but it could also be a life and, it, and, and it's a beginning, a middle and an end. And that's a very succinct description of, of, um, of a whole system. And I really like this idea of whole systems that a that a painting has a foreground, a middle ground, and a and a background, a distance, and those are those are important things to me. But uh, I made this painting. The specific view in this painting are three words, and they're written on the rocks. And I'm sure that you can't see them here, but uh, the 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 words on the rocks are veritas, utilitas, and venustas, and they mean uh, veritas meaning truth, this is in Latin, meaning truth, and the truth would be the, the visual truth of the painting, the, the look of the, of the sunlight hitting on the stone, the, the look of the hills, etc., that, that kind of truth. Uh, utilitas meaning the usefulness of a work of art, and number three, venustas meaning the attractiveness of the work. Um, all three of them are interesting words that were, uh, there, there are precedents for these three words describing a, uh, a work of art. And uh, the first would be from Plato, who described a work of art as consisting of three things, Ophelia, uh, 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 I'm just blanking on, on the name. Anyway, his, his three words were uh, mimetic correctness first, and that means the realism, as you could, might call it. Uh, second, the usefulness of the work. And number three, the attractiveness of the work. And in both cases, and, and then it was, it, was, um, it was then used by the uh, Roman architect and writer Vitruvius. And he said that a criteria for a building would contain three things. Clearly he was inspired by Plato. He said the, the, uh, for a building, it should be fermitas, meaning strength, and utilitas, meaning usefulness, and number three, uh, venustas, meaning attractiveness. And it was interesting to me that, that neither, neither Plato nor Vitruvius used the word beauty instead of attractiveness, because it's a slightly, it, it's a slightly different meaning to venustas compared with uh, 
uh, pulchritude in Latin or, or kalos in uh, Greek. Yes, well, uh, well uh, attractiveness, I guess, explains what, what an artist hopes for is, to, is that the work attracts us. Is that part I think so, of yeah. As yeah. opposed to beauty, which doesn't necessarily require attraction. Uh, well, I mean, it's a, com it's a complicated uh, whole idea in the first place, and which I really like about the difference between attractiveness, because, I mean, it's possible to be attracted to someone who is unattractive. I mean, uh, what the, the French call joli laid, that is, is your, a, a, a sort of an attractive ugliness, like Jean-Paul Belmondo was, you know, having that, uh, that unusual face that he had. This painting is basically 10 feet across, and, uh, and so it's very large. I think we may have an installation view of this, but it's, 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 uh, but it's yeah, this is, there we are. Uh, that was the installation at the Crocker Art Museum. The rock arch itself is the symbol uh, of, of this portal into a whole other, a whole other world, basically. And, a, and, a, and it's a bit of a pun in the sense that the specific view we're looking out at the distance, but the, but the distance itself is what I'm working with. I'm working with the distance of time. And, uh, and I, in, in, in Italy, I have been shown before with artists who are called anachronisti, which mean meaning uh, anachronistic artists who are doing things out of our period, out, out of contemporary art. Um, and and as, as I have been doing, but that idea of distance is important to me. And you'll find that in just about all of the paintings, uh, there is a far distance that's viewable. And, uh, and not all artists have done that. Um, I mean, a lot of artists have sort of a, 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 a narrow distance in the past or, it's, or, or no distance at all if they just have a dark background. Um, I told myself this is another thing. You know, I made up all of these rules. It seems like art uh, anymore has no rules. You can basically do anything. And I concede that you can do anything with art and make do do anything and name it as art and it is art now whether it's good art or bad art is another question but uh but it there there are no rules anymore so i thought it was just more interesting to establish for myself some rules and and one of those rules was always showing the far distance and another one was always always having whatever it was that i was painting out in the sunlight beautiful and, that, and usually the late sunlight. And if you're speaking about symbolism, that idea of the late sunlight, which is sometimes called the golden hour, the last of the sunshine uh, as, it, as it gets towards evening, um, it's, it's, it's something that represents that idea, like I said with the diver, like going from one element into another, going from daytime into night, and it's, or, or life into death again. And, and, it, and, it, and it's meant that for a lot of artists for a long time. So uh, that idea of the golden hour is something that is really, really important to me. And so my paintings tend to, to have, uh, and hopefully have that quality of late afternoon sunlight. We probably have some aspiring painters here who are in awe at the moment. And uh, it, it is incredible. I, I mentioned this very early on today. I'm not sure everyone was with us, but I said that pain, uh, that David has the ability to make paintings that seem brighter than, than the unpainted white canvas that he uses, which of course has, in photography, we call it maximum white. You know, Ansel Adams makes prints that look like they have whiter whites than photo paper and blacker blacks than photo paper. And David, uh, I almost feel like we need sunglasses sometimes when we look at light reflecting. I mean, this looks brighter than white canvas to me. Well, it's just a matter of contrast between ha having the quite dark darks and, uh, and, and then the, the very light lights, yeah. Yeah, and David, you mentioned that your painting, you often will include uh, distance um, uh, and I think a lot of painters don't follow you down that road because it is so hard to, to, to show foreground and background as skillfully as you do. I think in some of the Big Sur paintings that we have coming up, uh, uh, my wife is a painter and we 
look at your work and and you do something that I don't hardly see in any other landscape. You can actually paint haze. You're painting atmosphere. I mean, you're showing me the invisibility of air, but you, we can see it. It's unbelievable. Thank you. Well, yes, that's that is part of <laughs> part of my job. <laughs> Speaking of landscapes, we're going to uh, transfer into uh, landscapes here. Okay, this is this is then. Uh, a painting called Landscape for Bacchus and Philemon. Uh, Bacchus and Philemon was a, uh, a story, uh, the story of Bacchus and Philemon was by Ovid, the Roman writer Ovid. And it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful story. Uh, and I'm gonna tell this story, I think we have time here, uh, because, it's, because I think it's just one of the most beautiful and humanistic stories. Um, the story was that, um, Bacchus and Philemon were an old man and an old woman, and they were extremely poor, and they were living in the country, and <clears throat> they had almost nothing. Meanwhile, uh, Jupiter and Mercury were going around knocking on doors, and they were dressed as beggars. They were dressed like homeless people that we see now, and they were going from door to door and asking for food, handout, or whatever, and door to door in this valley were slammed in their face and they and they just kept going from door to door until they came to the house of Bacchus and Philemon. Old man and old woman who were so poor had almost nothing but they said come in come in we don't have much but we will we will share with you what we have and uh, they began stirring some porridge that was over the fire and they began uh, trying to, to scrub off the table that they had with some herbs and, uh, and make, make, uh, make it hospitable for these two beggars that they thought were beggars. And uh, <clears throat> they began pouring them some wine and uh, the wine that they were pouring was not diminishing in the, in the pot uh, that they were pouring it from. And, and they began to suspect that maybe these were not really beggars or homeless people, that they were in fact gods. And they fell down on their knees in their little house and they said, please forgive us for our poor fare. And Jupiter said, don't worry about it. He said, what you have done for us, none of the rest of the houses in this valley have done. And we give you a wish and Bacchus and Philemon looked to each other and they said, well, the wish that we would like to have is that we would never be alone, that if we die, we will be together. And Jupiter granted them their wish and he said, and in addition, I'm going to build a temple for you here and you will be the caretakers of the temple. So you always have income, always have some kind of money. And so one day they were sitting outside of the temple on a low wall and you can see a kind of low wall on the side over to the right hand side there. And they were sitting on this low wall and they all of a sudden realized that they were dying. And this old man and this old woman who had spent their life together had only a moment's time to turn to each other and say, thank you, my darling, for the wonderful life you have given me. And as they were saying those words, they're their shoulders and heads were turning into tree branches and two trees grew up right next to one another. One of them was a linden tree and the other was an oak tree. And those two trees stood there for many years and people would come by and know the story and know that those trees were actually the metamorphosized uh, figures of Bacchus and Philemon and treat them with great reverence. And, Actually, they would hang things on the trees, um, gifts to them. And uh, sort of the way that we put, uh, people put um, flowers and uh, on memorial roadside shrines, you know, today where people have been killed in a car accident or something, there would be a cross and there will be some flowers and, and, uh, and, and it, would be, it would be sort of like that. But this, the, the temple that you see here is actually the temple of the Athenians in Delphi and the, the, oh, and <laughs> I, I failed to mention an important point is that uh, after, after Jupiter uh, granted their wish, he 
flooded the valley where all of the other houses would have been and created this great kind of swamp area and, uh, and, and made all of those people leave their houses and for their, for their inhospitable, uh, inhospitality. And uh, this is, I mean, this, this meant a lot to me because I worked for many, many years with uh, homeless people in Salinas and as a volunteer at Dorothy's place in Salinas. And uh, so I, I, I knew that theme quite well, that idea quite well. And we're going to see a still life of yours that uh, uh, reference. Let's refer to that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Ah, uh, your viewer would mention perspective before. This, book, this painting is called Perspectiva, and it's quite large. Uh, and I think we may have a, a, a installation shot of this painting. There we go. That's, that shows the size of the painting. If you go back to it, this is the um, baptistry in Florence. And uh, Florence is, is a city that is, is almost my second home. Uh, we go to Florence, have been going to Florence almost every year for the last 40 years. And uh, um, anyway, um, but you know, some of these ideas, some of these things get very, very complicated. And this particular idea of making a painting of the baptistry was because the um, architect, the great architect, uh, Brunelleschi, Filippo Brunelleschi, had, uh, who designed the Duomo in Florence, the great dome on the cathedral in Florence, uh, he made the first perspective painting from the doorway of Santa Maria di Fiori, the, the, the Duomo, uh, and it was of the baptistry from the door, and it was the first codified example of uh, perspective that, that anyone had done. He, he, he figured out how perspective really works. And uh, the, the word pers perspectiva is written over the doorway. And what you're seeing is if you, it, 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 as I say, this is a very large painting, but in the background through the doorways, you can see two figures and they're dressed in room in, in Renaissance kind of clothes, but they're shaking hands. And because what perspective is, linear perspective is a system of agreement for all of the visual elements in a, in a, in a view. Uh, so all of those buildings agree to the horizon line, and the horizon line is always the, at the level, at the eye level of the viewer, always. And, uh, and they, they agree with that horizon line, and they agree with a certain point in that horizon line, if they are truly vertical and horizontal. Excellent. And you, you rely so much uh, on perspective. Um, for this painting, this is a perfect example of uh, measurements on your part and observations. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you get such precision in your paintings? Well, I have to tell you that I wanted to make this painting and um, I was doing an exhibition in Los Angeles and this would have been in about 19, when did I do this? Uh, in the late nineties, anyway. Uh, I, I, I wanted to make this painting for the show. I wanted to make this point because most, most of the paintings that I make, you know, they have a point to make. And, uh, and I wanted to have this point in that exhibition. So I decided to do it. And, um, but what I didn't realize was how much work it was going to be. And it was a tremendous amount of work. And I had, I had measuring points set up in the in my studio on the, the, the wall was 40 feet long and I had these distant uh, vanishing points in there for the side panels and, and I had a nail driven into the wall and I was using a long stick to draw my lines and all of these, all of these details in it, the marble inlay on the, on the surface um, uh, were, were incredibly complicated to draw out and paint in and it just took me so long. I, I thought at the time, I thought it was kind of like taking a big sheet of glass and letting it fall on the floor and then having to glue it all back together again because it was so complicated. And uh, I, I, um, 
I, I just remember how, uh, how very, very difficult it was, but I'm, I el ended up being very happy with the painting and the, the buildings around it are not the buildings that are there now. I used, I, I, I used the kinds of um, uh, buildings that, uh, that Masolino painted into the, into the murals in the Brancacci Chapel and uh, that back in, in the Renaissance days. So these are more Renaissance buildings. The buildings that are around the baptistry now are really 19th century buildings. I loved, by the way, I loved the perspective classes that I have at Art Center. And that's one of the things that I don't think most schools teach anymore because for, for say architects and whatnot, they don't need to do perspective because it can all be done on the computer. Well, you know, as Bruce pointed out, I think he, um said that you have symbolism you have symbols embedded or hidden like jewels in in your paintings the words that we can make out in rock faces but you know even for your fans who who don't uh, know the meaning of all the symbols you embed uh one word that every viewer will come away with when they stand in front of a painting this scale is courage you are one bold <laughs> painter to take on this challenge well, or craziness yes you yes say that i think yeah <laughs> i think so so yeah uh, well, it's a challenge it's a challenge it's a, it, it really is a challenge and uh, that was a, that, that painting is a good I, good example of that kind of a challenge especially when you have a deadline for it like i had for the show oh nothing like a deadline well you know david yeah. you mentioned how time consuming these are. And, and you once told me you had, as you mentioned today, a beautiful studio home out in Corral de Terre or otherwise Steinbeck's pastures of heaven out there in paradise. And you, you once mentioned that you were so happy and it was a long distance to get to your home on a mountaintop, yeah. an arduous drive. You once said you, you wouldn't leave home for weeks uh, happily and you, you'd spend so much time in your studio. Well, it's true. I did, and uh, and I didn't have to go out because my husband Gary uh, taught at Hartnell, and and he could bring home food. <laughs> Thank you, Gary, for yeah. fueling the fires and the paintbrushes. Well, you know, a, a related thought to uh, being a committed artist, spending so many hours in your studio. Um, do you think you're missing any life of life by spending? days and days and days in the same room rather than going fishing and stuff <laughs> yes i you know it's a it, you know as i say we we generally go to italy every year and so that's a and that's a life but just being there just being as it was in corral de tierra just being in that location and looking out on the wonderful landscape that we the view that we had and out over the over the bay to Santa Cruz, um, that, that just just being in that place. I like being places. I'm, I'm, I, I like being in one place and, and really experiencing that place for itself rather than running around a lot. Very good. I also love being in New York, by the way. <laughs> um, and have shown in New York since 1966. And so I've been there many, many, many times. And, uh, and but I've never lived there. I've always, lived in California. And of course, your wonderful gallery, the, the prestigious Herschel Adler has represented you for decades in New York City. So there's a Laguerre presence in New York City. There have, there, there, I've been through many galleries in New York. And uh, they, I mean, over the years, they have closed for one variety for, you know, because someone dies or because of, of my sort of uh, unhappiness with them for whatever reason and moving to a different gallery so i've so i've been in a succession of galleries in new york and uh which has given me a good deal of ex experience with galleries that's good uh, so, here's here's your window view or could be this was, this was part of the view that we had at, at corral de tierra there were um, hills rising up over to the left hand side um, at, but um, that were uh, which is where the sun was setting. But this was the view that we had off in the distance. And that's in the far distance is Santa Cruz. I didn't actually see any red ponies from that view. Uh, <laughs> but there were cattle around, but no red pony. So I put it 
red pony in there. Uh, it, and again, courage, you know, I mean, to me, a cloud would be one of the most difficult things to paint in the world. But you're a master of, of a delicate... Well, I'm, not, I'm not as good a master, for instance, as uh, uh, Andrea Johnson, who is Chris Winfield's wife, who makes the most glorious clouds. And she does it over and over again. And she's just an absolutely wonderful cloud painter. So if you, if you don't know her work, look at, look at her work, too. You're very modest, Maestro. Uh, I think you uh, gave her a few tips in your day. Well, I don't know that I, I don't know that I have. She's given me some tips. Actually. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. very kind of you. Very good. And she paints in acrylic too. She does. And that is, I, I think is so much harder than painting in oils. I don't know how she does it. I know. I can't, I can't. She's one of the few acrylic painters I've ever seen that actually can make a painting look like it was oil. You know? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah, she's really good at it. Yeah, she's she's very, very, very patient. Need a lot of courage to be, to do this, in acrylic, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And again, the scale, incredible. And the light. Okay, the, 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 uh, these two paintings, uh, one of them is uh, the, the Salinas River near Bradley. And, uh, and the other one is the back of Corral de Terra. And our house would have been up on the hill over, our house was at 1200 feet. And, uh, and it would have been up on the hill out of sight uh, to the right of where this image is in the back part of Corral de Tierra. And if any of you, any of you, you pro probably there are people who know what Corral de Tierra looked like in the old days when there were, there was only one house that was back there, that old house from, I think probably the 19th century or early 20th century, that wonderful old wooden house that's there. And, uh, but now there are numbers of, of houses and whatnot back there. And now, the interesting thing for me about the, the second, uh, about the, uh, the landscape with the Salinas River is um, that's in a, a collection up in San Francisco. It's in someone's house in San Francisco. And, uh, um, but they have used it as a, an example of the valley on the, uh, at the rest stop down near San Miguel. And they have a display with photographs of different things about the Salinas Valley. And they used a photograph of this with permission. They, they used a photograph of this painting. I, I like that idea of people looking at it like that. I, I, we can be sure Steinbeck would have one of these in his living room if, if you two had crossed paths age well, you know, this painting actually was in an exhibition that I did at the Steinbeck Center in, I think, about 2000. And, uh, the, um, and it was one of my favorite exhibitions. Uh, and, and Gary Smith had done the curating of this. And it was basically a two-person exhibition because it was my paintings. And it was quotes from John Steinbeck. And it was quotes about landscape that were in his books. And so the, the paintings were there. And then there were these large texts next to them. They didn't necessarily describe exactly what it was that I was, that I was painting. But it, they, they, uh, they were equivalents to the kind of landscape the, that, uh, that I was painting in the Salinas Valley and the, and the pastures of heaven. Wow. I'm sure many uh, of us today are familiar with Steinbeck's East of Eden. And uh, that book gets my vote for the, for the finest opening two pages, if I'm, if I'm right, uh, in describing this area. Uh, and he... You know, he explains why Salinas is called Salinas, you know, be, uh, and, and uh, the, the Catholic names that, that uh, are used for so many places in our location. But those are phenomenal opening pages about... about I have history. not read it for such a long time. I don't remember those opening pages, but, uh, but he could be very succinct and very, and very specific in his descriptions of things. And, uh, I, uh, and, and just and just wonderful, really, really good. And by the way, I would say that The Pastures of Heaven is a marvelous short book. And it is an example of that idea of et in Arcadia ego in that he describes all of these lives of the people who lived in what is now Corral de Tierra, what he called The Pastures of Heaven and described all of those lives and then 
some of them were kind of tragic, some of them were humorous, some of them were sweet. Um, and, um, and then uh, as the story goes, the, the, uh, this busload of tourists looking down on uh, looking down on Corral de Tierra from what is now Lorellis Grade up there and looking and saying, oh, if I lived there, my life would be so perfect. Everything is so ideal. And yet at the same time, they, you know already that the lives have not always been so perfect down there. Excellent. My life was perfect there, however. Thank oh. you. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> pastors of heaven. As far as the technique is concerned, it's just um, I do what I have to do to get it to look the way that I want it to look. I guess maybe that's the, <laughs> the best description of it. Sometimes things look very tight when you see them in, in you know, the size like is on your screen, but in fact, in person, they can be quite a bit less tight than that. They can be a little looser looking. And, uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I, 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 I just do what I have to do to make the image that I want to make. David, I had the great joy of seeing you painting in your studio uh, a couple of years ago, and I was surprised, and, and correct me technically, uh, but it looks like you're painting on traditional kind of nubby uh, woven canvas. Isn't that right? Um, it, it, I, I am painting on, on canvas now. I have to say, when I began doing the kind of paintings that I started doing in 1979, I was working in extremely traditional ways. I was stretching raw linen onto uh, stretcher bars and then coating it with rabbit skin glue, which is the very, very old, old technique, and then coating that with a lead underpainting and uh, then, then, then doing a, 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 another colored underpainting on top of that and then finally making the painting on, on top of it all. So I was working in a very, very traditional way. Um, I don't do that now. I, I buy pre-primed pre canvas. And uh, some, of, some of it is a little nubby. The earlier ones were quite nubby, but uh, the earlier ones, uh, I mean, the, the, the later ones are not nearly as um, textured as, they, as the uh, early ones. Yeah. Well, I just mentioned that detail because you you do get such a, a detailed result that I just couldn't believe that's possible on a on a textured surface. But somehow you do it; it's incredible. I don't know. <laughs> I just do okay. it. And here's here's yet another uh, style. Or well, the... yeah. Well, um, I as I say, I decided at the very beginning that I was going to make all three of the various kinds of paintings that was possible to make figure paintings, mostly figure paintings that are based on some kind of history, uh, landscapes and still lifes. And so I have done all three and I would alternate from exhibition to exhibition. I would do an exhibition of still lifes one point and then do, a, then do landscapes maybe the next one. And, uh, and so I usually do one exhibition a year. And, uh, <clears throat> but th this, this particular painting, uh, well, first of all, this form, this, um, uh, altar-like form uh, I made in 1987 and I thought that I would do a couple of paintings on that because it gave me all you know I, 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 I said before that in my painting with a, a specific view that I was trying to create whole systems you have a foreground you have a middle ground and you have a background and I wanted to have those things in these paintings, I wanted to I wanted to be a, a whole system where you knew just where the light was coming from. The light coming from the right hand side, the sunlight, and it's casting the shadow on the wall over on the left hand side. And so you know you know just exactly how close to the horizon line the sun is because that describes the the shadow. The higher up the shadow is on the wall, there, uh, the lower down the sun is to the sea. And, uh, and also then there's the reflections and everything is answered 
all of the, every, every, everything is answered, the reflection back from the wall over on the left-hand side, the, uh, the, the, the reflection, for instance, of the, of the bread against the, the grape juice. Well, now, why did I make these paintings, this painting of, of um, grape juice and sandwiches, um, which is called Xenia. You can see the word Xenia written down below. In ancient Greece, a Xenia was a food gift for strangers who came to stay in your house. Strangers, they could be relatives. They're not like uh, uh, people you don't know, but they could be relatives, but they're strangers. And uh, it, 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 they, uh, they come to your home and the first night they would eat with the family. And then the subsequent nights, they would be given a basket of food that they would eat in their own quarters. And uh, so, um, I wanted to make a painting of a Xenia. Now, I was working with the, with the um, homeless shelter in Salinas with Dorothy's Kitchen. And one of the food things that they had for lunch at Dorothy's were sandwiches. And the other thing was grape juice. They've been given a big donation of grape juice and they uh, would serve grape juice every day. And, uh, and I thought that I would like to make a painting that was a literal Xenia, that this was literally food for strangers, for outsiders, food gift, really. And, uh, and so um, I, I made this painting, and it's really a dedication to Dorothy's place, to the Salinas Dorothy's place. And, 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 and uh, you know, it, it, this painting is in the de Young Museum. It's been hanging in the de Young for, for probably 15, 18 years now yeah. um, <clears throat> in their still life section. But, uh, but this was literally a food gift for strangers and, and, a, and dedicated to the wonderful work that they do at Dorothy's Place in Salinas. It still, it still goes. I don't volunteer there anymore, but I did for 23 years. Wow. Well, you didn't spend every minute in your studio, that's for sure. No, that no, that was, that was, and you know, that was an education also working there, my goodness. Yeah. Learning about life, oh, and, and uh, sometimes faces, you know, are are uh, a, an issue or a challenge in your work, and you must have seen some incredible faces, uh, you know, very photographic, memorable. I see incredible faces everywhere. <laughs> hey, uh, another obvious question: Would you need to set up this scene in order to paint it? Oh, absolutely, and I and I should point out that all of these paintings that you have been looking at involve photography. I set them up, and I uh, in, in just the way that I want them, and then I make a photograph. And this one uh, looks to me like it was set up uh, that it, that it's that it's about you know uh, half an hour before the sun goes down. And I like, as I told you before, I like that late late afternoon sunlight, the golden hour. And, uh, and then uh, I photograph it and then I paint from the photographs. It used, I used to paint from a, a slide of the photograph that I had taped to a, to a, a, a view, a, 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 what do you call it? A viewer around my neck. What do you call it? Uh, the, the, the loop around mm -hmm. my neck. And, and uh, I would paint from that. Now uh, I don't do slides anymore because it's too complicated a business to try to do with the uh, they don't they don't develop them easily anymore. So I I work using the laptop now. Beautiful. Well, um, to always uh, dress my figures in historical dress, and th this has been a problem. It's a problem for me because sometimes people can look sort of ridiculous dressed in. And togas and whatnot. Um, but it's funny because I, um, in an exhibition that I did in Los Angeles in 1986, the art critic for the Los Angeles Times criticized me for dressing at people in historical dress. And he said that all great painters have um, always dressed their figures in the, the clothing of the day, even if they were dealing with uh, historical themes. And he was just simply absolutely wrong about that because there have been plenty of painters who have dressed their figures in, in ancient dress, including people like Titian or Poussin, particularly who never once in his entire life, Nicolas Poussin, the French artist, uh, never once dressed his figures in contemporary dress. So he was just 
stupid. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah, he's ignoring every historical painting that was made not during those historical days. <laughs> yeah. The Renaissance artists oftentimes dress figures in uh, in contemporary dress, dress from that period. Yes, it does. That's not a coincidence. And I thought that it was, well, I mean, it, it, I, I wanted to do this as a very matter of fact painting of those objects from Dorothy's place. And by the way, I photographed those in that late light. And then I took the grape juice and I took the sandwiches to the soup kitchen and they were actually served to people there. So again, it's kind of like communion. And the, the people who ran Dorothy's place were Franciscan workers, and so it was a Catholic. It was a Catholic group that ran it, and it and it seemed to me to be appropriate that it was like the wine and the bread. The, almost all of the still lifes, and and this one included. This is a very early still life that I did of, with a skull and a Polaroid. Uh, speaking of contrasting elements. Um, and the size is for the still lifes is basically about 20 by 24 inches. I like for the objects in them to be just about life size. The, uh, the bigger paintings, I mean, of course, I love making big paintings. And, uh, and so a, a landscape lends itself to a large size. And, the, and, the, and some of the figures, you know, lend themselves to a large size too. Yeah. Is that Polaroid life size? Just about, pretty yeah. much, yeah. A little bit of a trompe l'oeil effect then it would yeah, be. Yeah, it was, I have to tell you that it was really fun making a painting of a photograph that was meant to look like a photograph. <laughs> I don't know if I could follow you there, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's complicated, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it doesn't bother me at all. And in fact, sometimes there are things, sometimes there are references in the paintings that do, uh, that do suggest maybe uh, de Curico or do suggest, and, and sometimes I put them in there very particularly so people can find them, little secret things that would reference Poussin. For instance, the, I, we didn't see the large landscape uh, with uh, with, with um, uh, Jody drinking from the spring, which is from the Red Pony, um, but it, it, the the figure I very purposefully posed so that it was the same exact pose as a figure in a Nicholas Poussin painting. So they're 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 filled with things like that, and that's wonderful that you that you are noticing those things. And uh, so, so they do actually exist, even though they sometimes are not necessarily part of the story, but they're, but they're um, just references that I like to acknowledge. You know, the final sentence in uh, David's letter to uh, the critic, uh, David Genschel, and he, his final uh, sentence is, art becomes a metaphor for carefully looking at analyzing and then acting with full knowledge. So there's a lot a lot of knowledge being transferred in your work. And I almost see your work as having various layer, layers. You know, the uneducated viewer, which I often am coming to these. Um, I, it was a treat for me to learn about Xenia in your writings and that whole act of gifts, food gifts to uh, strangers. But, you know, if I were you, David, and, I, and you're way ahead of me on this, you know, uh, goal number one is to make a, a fantastic painting. And even if people don't know what a zinnia is and they don't know the reference, it's still a complete reward. And yet you embed these with little gifts um, for the lucky people, the, the few lucky people who would come to this painting and know what a zinnia was. Uh, it's an added bonus. It's value added, really. It's a bonus track. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think it's a real treat to load your work with, with gifts for those, even if it's a third of your audience who gets them, I think it's worth doing. Well, I mean, I think that uh, just simply the, I mean, it's, it's for me, it can be really fun. I mean, painting that stack of sandwiches 
was really fun to do. It was not like the baptistry. It was not, it just looking really, really carefully at a stack of like Wonder Bread and, and painting <laughs> that was, was, was really fun. I think you've given Wonder Bread the most reverence that's ever had in its yeah, probably. Probably life. Yeah, but they, I, I, I have to say they have a wonderful label with this painting that's up at the De Young, and uh, and the label really is, is is all about the idea of the Xenia and you know what that means and the Franciscan workers and so on. Oh. So I'm really happy to have that that explanation on the wall there. Well, um, I just finished a, have finished a painting of another rock arch, big rock arch with the sea in the background and the sun. I've, I've I, you know, I made these rules for myself and said that the sun was always going to be coming from either the right hand side or the left hand side and uh, creating objects which were half in light and half in shadow as these are. And uh, I, um, uh, in, in, this, in this last painting, and it's quite large, 60 by uh, 80 inches, and it, it, it's another rock arch with the sea in the background, and the sun is setting in the center of the arch, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a, a kind of a, a painting about the um, supremacy of the sun itself, and uh, it's possible to you know, think. I mean, uh, we, we we didn't look at it, but the painting of the of the candle is, is all about this idea of Plato's cave and the sun as knowledge and sunlight as knowledge. And uh, so um, that's kind of what this new latest painting that I have made uh, is all about. Thank you, my friend. You're on a trip right now, and we thank you for your time and. We wish you all the best of health and keep on going in your studio. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will.